Well, I heard a story of a dad who was talking with his kids about how they felt about the COVID-19 pandemic. He asked, are, are you sad to be leaving your friends? Are you afraid? And he was asking this because they were moving, his work was moving his family to Hong Kong. And the older children all replied that, that they were okay and that they were excited about the adventure of being in Hong Kong and, and that they weren't afraid. And then his five-year-old son hadn't answered and the father looked at him and said, well, what do you think? And the five-year-old son broke down in tears. And mom and dad held him and they, they began to say, well, t tell us what's on your heart. And the five-year-old burst out in tears and said, I'm just so sad that all these people in China are dying. Don't we realize that sometimes in these horrific moments of fear, gripped in the crisis of this pandemic, a place where none of us have ever been before, what is it that we're feeling? What does it have, what are, what are the feelings that we've had and yet here in a moment captured in the heart of a precious five-year-old child is the real place that Christians should ever try to be. Truly captivated with compassion for the suffering. Truly captured with the love for the lost. And truly manifesting the heart of God. Thinking of others before thinking of self. And isn't that what we naturally do? We default to ourself. It's easy. Um, am I going to have enough to eat? Am I going to have enough to drink? Am I going to have enough to wear? Of course, we do care for others by taking care of ourselves, and we often tell ourselves that. But notice how we think of self first before we think of others. I love Margaret Batterton. She's a Christian, a woman... I know who lives in a small community northeast of Dallas. She's used her talents to gather her fellows who love to sew, to make mask covers for Baylor hospitals. She's using her gift to help others and mobilize others to help others because of her compassion for others that's turned into action for others. And she's not alone. There are many others who are doing the same. And even among our own membership here, there are people doing exactly the same thing, some in small ways, some in big ways. There are some who are making big sacrifices outside of their own commitments to the medical profession. And they're moved to do that because of love. But not everyone does the same thing. Not everyone has the same gifts. Not everyone even has what is available to serve. But in the words of the five-year-old that we just talked about, everyone has that. The ability to capture the heart of God. Don't lose your love. Don't lose your vision. Don't lose your joy. Don't let a pandemic turn your heart away from the person God has called you to be. Which reminds me of the prophet Jonah. Kids remember him as the big fish story. Adults remember him as the stubborn and arrogant prophet. And both of these are true caricatures of this book in your Old Testament called Jonah because it's a book about him and not really about God and not really about what God did through him. And in the middle of the story, the most amazing, techno, unbelievable, just can't imagine that the whole thing went down like that, is the moment when a heart in the isolation in the belly of a great fish is captured and captures the heart of God. And that's what I want us to think about today. So if you have your Bible, read with me in Jonah chapter 2. If you're not familiar with the story of Jonah, it's just simply this, that God had called this Jewish prophet Jonah 
to go to the city of Nineveh, the great capital city that has and, and had influenced the world in profoundly pagan ways. And as a God-fearing Jew, Jonah could not imagine that God would want to do anything to save Nineveh. And so he sought out ways to avoid God's call to him to go to Nineveh. And yet in the storm, when he's escaping on the boat, he's surrounded by pagans who show more concern for him than Jonah even showed for the Ninevites. And after what we're about to read in chapter 2, we'll discover that, that God is able to persuade Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he preaches to Nineveh. And the people repent, and God's punishment against them is delayed. But the irony is, is that while Jonah appreciated the blessing of grace that God had given him in the belly of the fish, and the grace that would manifest itself in chapter 4, the story ends with a Jonah who can't be changed. So read with me in Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from the stomach of the great fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and thou didst hear my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All thy breakers and billows passed over me. And so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great depth engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But thou hast brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. And those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. And the chapter ends, and the Lord commands the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. So ask yourself, first. Did you pray last week? Did you pray out loud last week? Did you cry out to the Lord? Did you pray with someone else? Did you pray when things were going well? Did you pray when things were going bad? Did you pray instead of getting angry? Did you pray instead of gossiping? And did you pray when you were in stress? And did you pray because you were in a panic? When we experience these fleeting emotions, in the life that we once knew, the question of prayer becomes academic. But, we're in, but when we are in the belly of a pandemic, it almost seems ridiculous for me to ask you those questions, right? So when Jonah is in the belly of this fish, what did his prayer show? Well, the first thing is that it showed prayer in faith. Notice how he says, from the depth, in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the current swelled about me, but you, Lord my God, brought, up me, brought my life up from the pit when my life ebbed away. 
I remembered You, Lord. Notice how faith is what captures Jonah in the belly. How he recognizes his need to throw upon God all of his concern, all of his needs, and all of what he knows is his only rescue. He prayed that God had heard him in the past. He prayed that in the presence God would hear him again. And he prayed with the understanding that God would save him from the pit. Some people look at this section and you'll notice in your Bible that it's put in a margins offset. Because what he's doing is he's quoting from Psalms. He's quoting from many passages that were part of the Jewish Psalter, the books from which they drew their praise and they drew their prayers. Whether the writer is trying to help us understand the prayer that Jonah would have prayed or the prayer that Jonah did pray, verse 1 says, and Jonah prayed. And it says, and Jonah prayed to Yahweh. And it says, Jonah prayed to Yahweh his God. So in that moment, faith captured Jonah. That's why Jesus told the disciples in Mark 11 and verse 24, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it. And notice to Christians in James chapter 5, James tells us this, In James chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Prayer is for the glory of God, but prayer is to lift the burdens of saints. So let the lesson that out of the belly where you are, pray in faith. Notice something else that he says in his prayer. He said, I I will look again to your holy temple. And I will shout grateful praise and sacrifice to you. And what I have vowed, I will make good again. Because salvation comes from the Lord. So then in this prayer in his mind, not only was he casting upon God his trust, but he was promising God and looking forward with greatness this relationship that he knew as a Jew would be his of worship. And as already been said, I miss all of you. The empty pews scattered around us remind me how important You are to the fellowship of this church. You are what makes this sharing a sharing in worship, a blessed sharing. We can worship God alone. We can worship God with our spouses and our children. But God has called us to be together. And in days like today, this prayer in crisis, this prayer out of the depths of the belly, of the great fish, shows us how prioritized our worship together should always be. 
When the crisis is over, will you yearn to be with your fellow belovers? <laughs> belovers. I guess we are belovers. There is another Don Hooten thing to be on forever record on the internet. Do you yearn to be with fellow believers as you do today? The psalmist said in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. To give thanks to the name of the Lord. When this crisis is over, will your prayers utter how I long to be in worship? But the third and significant thing in the prayer that Jonah prayed out of the depths of the belly of the fish. He said, but you, Lord, my God, brought up my life from the pit. And when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. His prayer in humility. Maybe it was a fleeting humility. It's evidenced when we get to chapter 4, it must have been. And humility is just like that. Humility is something that we don't live with in constant, without thinking. It, humility is a choice. It is a something that you engage in that you decide to be. And generations before us have had to live with pandemics like polio or smallpox, influenza, cholera. <clears throat> They've lived through world wars, the fears of a nuclear holocaust. They knew if wars broke out, they would sacrifice something. And they knew they had less control of their world than you and I ever think that even in this moment, we really do. This pandemic shows us that we are just as dependent as Jonah felt in the belly. Solomon noted, Proverbs 18 and verse 12, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty. But humility comes before honor. Humility comes before honor. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, In God you come up against something which in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and looking down on people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. End quote. In the prayer that he prayed in the belly was a manifestation where he finally felt humility. And wherever you are in your belly of this awful time, allow the capture of your heart to be transformed by what you know God is and recognize that before Him, we are dependent. But Jonah never opened up his heart completely. As the book will show in the later reading, he obeyed God by going to Nineveh and preaching the message of repentance and the offer of God's mercy. And they did respond. But what Jonah's heart felt in chapter 1 was the same thing he felt in chapter 4. So when you are in the belly of your own great fish, are you just going to pray? Or are you going to open your heart with humility and really live? In uncertain times, there can be fear, anxiety, and a desperate sense of hopelessness. But God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but one of power and of love and discipline. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. 
If we find ourselves in our own belly of despair and feeling like we are drowning in the flood of our own crisis, we should turn our eyes upon Jesus. The one who has not only secured for us the reason for our faith in his sacrifice and in his resurrection, but the one who finished the course and from God received blessing, peace, and honor. We too can have the peace that passes understanding from a God who is great. We can have the love that crosses borders from a God who shows mercy to all. And today, we without hesitation can reach out to hold another's hand and think more of ourselves and think of another and say, God will be with us all the way. I praise you with all of